would turn with me to John 17. We are continuing in the high priestly prayer where Jesus is between the upper room and the garden of Gethsemane. And he pauses and for all of John 17, he actually prays and he prays for himself. He prays for the disciples and he prays for you and I. And in 17, 11 through 12, and even 13, there is a promise, there is a truth, there is a fact of Scripture. And what I find amazing is that there are so many today who will look at this particular truth or this particular fact and, and say it's not true or even fight against it. There are even denominations that have split off and formed their own denomination for the sole purpose of stating they will not believe this truth in Scripture. And this truth is tra- tra- taught plainly at least 30 times in the New Testament and referenced about 50 times in the Old Testament. And simply put, if you are saved today, If you can look in the mirror, if you can look at your Bible, if you can say to God and us plainly, I am saved truly by the blood of Christ today, you will be saved for all of eternity. You will be saying a billion years from now, I am saved. Because if you are saved today, you are always saved. This has been called in the colloquial, once saved, always saved by the Baptists, It is called eternal security. In seminary, we called it preservation of the saints because it has to have a big old name if it's a doctrine in seminary. God preserves us. It is preservation of the saints for all eternity. And I wonder why anybody would look at this and say, that's not a good deal. I don't like that. I am going to start a church, and I'm going to preach, that you can lose your salvation. In fact, you can lose it easily, and every time you lose it, you have to be re-baptized. And there are groups that call themselves Christian who actually believe that, when plainly in this passage and the teaching of Christ and Paul and others is that once you put a stake in the ground and say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, yes, his blood has been applied to my sins, Yes, my sins are as far as from the east as from the west. Remembered no more in the bottom of the deepest sea. That is an eternal condition. You will stand before Jesus Christ and he will welcome you because of that decision you made on earth on that day. And we need to understand that this can happen because I give no participation of human strength to this salvation event. God does not look and say, well, he's the smartest, I'm going to save him. Or she's a really great athlete, I'm going to save her. Or that person has a lot of money in the bank, I'm going to save them. There is actually nothing I can offer. There is nothing that I bring to an altar or a cross or anything and say, hey, God, look at me. Because God would look at the heart. And all of us born on this planet, except Jesus Christ, are deplorable, debauched, evil, and wicked. There is nothing good in our hearts. When we come to God, we offer Him garbage. When we come to God, we offer Him dirt. And we say, look at my dirt, isn't it pretty? But God is not interested in our dirt. And then when the Holy Spirit comes and we respond to the Holy Spirit and we accept Jesus Christ, the righteousness of God is put on us. And then we can stand before the cross, righteous and holy, not because of anything we've done, but because of everything that Christ has done. And that changeover from being wicked to being righteous is an eternal condition. And so we can look at those who make it to heaven, and when we make it to heaven, 
we will be able to stand and say, we are here 100% because of grace, because of Christ. And those who go to hell will be able to look at each other and say, they are there because they deserve it. Hell is the natural progression place of the human race. God saves us out of that, nothing we could do. And that saving is eternal. And I think there is a pride in the world. I think people look at that and say, for me to be saved based on nothing I do, for me to be saved just because God loves me is not good enough, that my pride will swell up and say, I must earn this, I must be a part of it, I must, like the Olympics, earn a gold medal, and then that will work my way into heaven. And I think pride, which is the most condemned sin in the Bible, stands between us and a true understanding of Christians and uh, Christianity. And I think those who call themselves Christians and still look forward to the day, if you will, that they can lose their salvation so that they can be saved all over again uh, is a difficult pill because of the pride. We must understand that it is no way to manipulate God into saving you. There is no way to get His attention. It is 100% based on His grace. And people will say, well, then you're getting a free ride for your sin. You must in some way repent or go to a place like purgatory or something and pay for your sin. And there's some people who say, well, I know by my experience, and that's another thing that can mess up our understanding of Scripture, is if I look at the Bible and I apply my experience to it and say, but I knew this person, I knew this person and I can name them who was raised in church, who was saved as a teenager in the youth group, and when they graduated from high school, they went to a secular college, and they never went to church again, and now 40, 50 years later, they're living like the devil. And I will be asked, and I have been asked, that exact situation, is that person saved? Is God going to let that person in? Because once saved, always saved. It means it doesn't matter what you do after you're saved. But the proper response from Scripture is if you're living like the devil, then you're living for the devil. And if you're living for the devil, you're not living for God. That decision that was made as a teenager wasn't a real decision. It was some emotional response to the group hysteria that may have been going on. But once saved, always saved means once saved, acting saved, always saved, always acting saved. Does that mean that I will sin? Yes. I will mess up. I will lose my temper. I will say a bad thing. I will commit offenses against God. But it isn't my lifestyle. I am not living like the devil. I am not living for the devil. I sin living for God because I am human and I praise God that at the end of time, that sin and desire for sin will be removed, and I will stand before God, holy and righteous, inside and out, because I will be changed, and there will be none of those problems of earth, none of the distractions of sin on earth, and that will last forever and ever and ever and ever. So in John 17, 11, Jesus says, I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And if you are the disciples and you're hearing this prayer, you've got to think, man, what a bummer. Jesus has just prayed that he is leaving, and I'm not. Like the parent who is leaving the toddler for, to go to work or something, the toddler wants to go with them. But the parent says, I am going where you cannot go. And Jesus is saying, I'm going away forever, and you're not going with me. But, of course, they will be rejoined with him and have been rejoined with him in heaven. And Jesus is going to unite with the Father, and that is where he is now. We say he is at the right hand of God the Father. He is united with the Father in purpose of praying for you, in looking after you, and sending the Holy Spirit to save people. 
And so the disciples have already been told that they're going to be killed and they're going to be tortured and they're going to be cast out of the synagogue. And now Jesus is saying he is going to go away and they are going to be left behind. But then he says he wants them, he wants God the Father, Holy Father, to keep these disciples in his name. And this is the first inkling of the eternal salvation that we speak about because when we've talked about God's name, God's name, when we pray in Jesus' name and things like this and we throw around the word name, back in those days it actually meant the essence of the person, that when I am praying in Jesus' name, I am praying in accordance with his will, I am praying in accordance with his desires, and I am trying to pray with the power of Jesus behind the prayer, saying this is something you would pray, Jesus, so let's get to it. And in the same way, God, the Father, has a will and has a desire, and it is the same holy desire that Jesus has. And if Jesus is saying, I'm giving these 11 at this point in time to God the Father to keep in his name, then everything God is, his sovereignty, his love, his justice, his will, everything he is, is going to keep those disciples. And the truth of the matter is, if somebody wants to get you out of heaven bound into hell bound, they got to beat God to do it. They got to get in a fair fight with God, which you can't get in a fair fight with God, and you got to beat him best him, and then pry you out of his will, pry you out of his sovereignty. And if somebody can do that, if somebody can pry you out of salvation, then the world is in a world of hurt anyway, and it wouldn't matter. Everything that God is, his absolute power and sovereignty, is focused on keeping you saved. All the forces of the universe will be drawn on keeping you saved for all eternity. And then in verse 12, he says, While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that scripture might be fulfilled. And we know that he's speaking of Judas. I have heard people preach that Judas lost his salvation, that Judas was clearly saved at the beginning. But I think the teaching and the fact that Jesus said it would be better if Judas had never been born, that's kind of a rough thing, rough thing for God to say, that Judas was never saved, that he was coming at it from a political point of view, that he was coming at it from a selfish point of view. And when Jesus says the scripture will be fulfilled. There are two scriptures that point to Judas. The first is Psalm 41.9. We read that. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Judas was Jesus' close friend and did eat with him. And scholars think that Psalm 109 is all about Judas. Specifically, eight, may his days be few. May another take his office. And when Jesus says that scripture is fulfilled, it does not mean that Judas was a puppet. Judas still had a free will. God just looked down the annals of history, saw what Judas would do, and predicted it in the Psalms. And then in 13, Jesus says, But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in, a, in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And so if you grab a hold of eternal security, if you grab a hold of the fact that I am free to function in this world as a saved person, and nothing I can do, good or bad, righteous or evil, not that I'm going to try, but nothing I can do in the normal course of life will cause God to kick me out. That should bring me to a place of peace and of satisfaction and of joy because it really doesn't matter what my friends say. It really doesn't matter what is said on TV. It doesn't matter what the government says. I am safe and secure for all eternity 
in the palm of God's hands. And I can then step out and I can, I can be courageous and maybe speak to somebody or visit somebody and I can do these things that would be scary knowing that even if they slam the door in my face, I am eternally saved. And God is with me that nothing on this earth is going to alter, weaken, change, or destroy my salvation. Imagine, if you will, that you wake up tomorrow morning and you find yourself in a college class, something like microbiology or something really hard that nobody really knows how to do. And the professor comes and says that he has some news and the class is going to be 16 weeks. And if you come every day to this class, you'll get an A and you'll graduate with honors. All you have to do is show up. And more than that, the professor has given you his special cell number so that when you're doing the homework and you don't get it, you can call him and he'll come right over and he won't, all, he won't just help you. A lot of the time he'll do the homework for you. And then at the end of 16 weeks, you'll graduate with an A in the class and you'll graduate with honors. And I would bet if that offer was made to a lot of people today, a lot of people just wouldn't show up. They would either think it's too easy or it's not real, but that's the deal God gives you. He saves you and says, all you got to do is show up. All you got to do is be there. And he'll do the work and he'll guide you and he'll move you. Many years ago, I was a teacher at Mission College, and I taught computer repair and software type stuff. And at the start of one of the classes, a guy came up to me and said, I know more than you. He was a young kid and obvious pride in his voice, and he said, I, I can teach this class, but I have to get through this class. And he says, I'll make you the deal. The deal will be if... You allow me to not show up and not do anything. Then the last day of class, I will come and take your final. And if I ace your final, you'll give me an A in the class. You'll forgive all the homework and all that. And I said, all right, give it a shot. I didn't care because I was the teacher. <laughs> and so we go through the whole 13 weeks and, and people are being taught and questions are being asked and he wasn't there. Then the last day of class, he shows up, and I hand out the final. It's 100 multiple-choice questions, okay? So you can guess your way through it if you're good. And he breezed through it, I mean, fast. And he turned it in, and I graded it while he was there, and he got four out of 100. <laughs> he missed 96. And I think there are a lot of people who see this deal from God, this new covenant, and they say, I'm just going to skate through life, and I'm going to show up on the last day, and I'm going to take the test in front of Jesus, and I'll be fine, because I know more than God, I know more than any pastor, I know this God thing inside and out. And so they live their life. And if you read Revelation 19, 20, around there, there's billions of people. It's a huge crowd standing before the throne of Jesus, all of them having that same idea, that they had a different way, that they had a better way, that they could figure that out on their own. And it says that the books are opened. And nobody's life can, can earn your way into heaven. So those books are a failure. And then there's the, Jesus says, open the book of life. And an angel runs over and gets one book with everybody's name in it. And he says, is their name in the book of life? In other words, has the blood of the cross been applied to them? And on some of them, a few, the angel will say yes. And on most of them, the angel will say no. And if the angel says no, that's how you ace the test. You accept Jesus Christ and apply the blood of the cross to your life.
Then when the angel, I mean, I mean, it must be the most devastating thing to hear, to have that angel say, no, Lord, their name's not here. And then Jesus says, depart from me, you worker of wickedness. Jesus has offered an amazing deal. All you got to do is believe and show up. And in that belief that you can't fail, that you're always going to win, because that's what this is saying. If you're in the hand of God, you're always going to win. You'll win for God. Then that should slowly but surely bring a joy to your life that nothing in this world can knock me down. Nothing in this world can stop me. I will win, and I will win on God's team. And I will win not because of anything I did, but because of grace, because of love, and because of the blood of Christ. You cannot lose. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, I just praise your name for this day. I praise your name that we have eternal security, that we have preservation of the saints, that we have all these things that the scripture talks about. Help us to be strong in understanding that we need to live for you. We need to show up for you. And in showing up for you, we cannot fail. We will always win. And we will spend eternity with you. And the angel will say, yes, Lord. His name is in the book. Yes, Lord. Her name is in the book. And Jesus will say, well done good and faithful servant, enter into your eternal rest. Lord, we praise you for that, and ask your blessing upon this time. We ask this through the blood of Christ. Amen.